Well, uh, I'm not sure I can pass my thanks on to uh, Sean for putting me after Kyle. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> Sean. Okay, um, complete change of tack. What I want to do first is have a quick look at what we define as a barrier. Then, why, why should we address barriers? Most of you will know these answers, but let's just reaffirm it. Then a quick look at what barriers we have in the Ribble. What have we done, and has it worked? Okay, pictorially, is that a barrier? Yeah. Okay, what about that? Yeah. Okay, what about that? Oh, good. It is. <laughs> Neil will know this, Ian will know this. That is a barrier to fish migration. Essentially, anything that prohibits any natural movement of fish is a barrier. Whether it's that big, whether it's that big or not. In fact, talking of hydrology, that fish there is on a gauging station. I've only ever seen Kyle fully defeated once, and that was in a meeting where we were trying to get that gauging weir removed. And when I saw uh, Kyle's face having uh, that distinct look of I've given up, I thought, I don't think we need to have this meeting. We'll just go home now. Anyway, okay. So, swan side. Is this a barrier? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We did a pit telemetry study, which is we inserted a small little tag into uh, a number of fish, and we set up uh, loops that would then record every time a fish tried to pass through at the bottom of the weir and another one at the top. Sorry, just a quick stop. I must thank Mike Forty, whose study and research this, is based, this talk is based on. Uh, he couldn't be here today, so in a way I'm, I'm subbing. So that as a barrier, we, these are some of the fish that we tagged, beautiful wild brown trout. And in the first year that we assessed it, you can see that we had a few successes. So some fish got over in certain conditions. So that's a key point, something that drives me mad. Oh, it's not a barrier because sometimes when the water's just right, the fish get over. No, 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 that's not good enough. You can see there that yes, a few fish got over, but the vast majority failed. What you will discover is that the two don't total to the same number. That's because one fish succeeded in getting over to come back down to then fail to get back up. <laughs> Never mind uh, uh, difficult anglers, we've got some very difficult fish. Okay, so the passage efficiency, key number, only 21% of fish can ascend this uh, barrier. Okay, chipping number one. We, we've been working at this site for a number of years, and the key aspect of this is this section here. Would you say that is a barrier? Yep, yeah, good. However, this will surprise you. Fish got over that. However, it took them, the median time it took to ascend was 108 hours. Five days nearer, damn it. Five days. Okay, chipping culvert. So we talked about culverts earlier. Nice deep pool beneath. Is this a barrier? Yes. Okay, passage efficiency, 37% of fish managed to ascend that, that <coughs> barrier. Okay, so why should we address barriers? Let's think a little bit outside the box. Flood risk, that culvert, if we remove that culvert, the houses that always get flooded when that culvert blocks or when it hasn't got enough capacity uh, wouldn't flood and we would have better fish passage. Better habitat, uh, I almost stole one of Paul's uh, wonderful diagrams that shows the habitat impacts of weirs, impounding gravel behind them. Often anglers have installed weirs to, to create fantastic deep pools behind which very quickly fill in with gravel and then you have no depth of water but you have a barrier to fish migration. Removing weirs will improve your habitat. Better water quality. That's a really interesting one. We had a dissertation done in 2008 that looked at differences in water chemistry above and below weirs and showed that generally speaking where we didn't have weirs we had better water quality than the water near to weirs. And I, I think it was when you were still here that you gave me a phone call Kyle from someone in the water quality team saying we've got this weir on the River Darwin and it's causing us massive issues with water quality and failing WFD. Would you like some money to rip it out? Yeah, but it's five metres tall and it has a hydro scheme that your environment agency consented. Anyway, more fish. Okay, I, when I wrote this presentation, I realised that I didn't have many fish pictures. So you'll see that I've thrown in a little bit of fish born all the way along. Um, why address barriers more fish? Better access to spawning habitat, kind of a given that we all know. Protecting the genetic diversity of fish. If you s sort of... Uh, uh, put in barriers and, and create really distinct subpopulations, you're not getting that wonderful passing on of genes across. And that, that was a key argument that I used with some anglers who didn't want fish passage 
uh, on cold water because they, they thought we were just trying to introduce salmon and, and ruin their trout fishing. Well, actually, no. We had some amazing big trout down at the bottom of Colne that couldn't ascend to the suitable spawning habitat above Colne and pass on their genes. Reduce risk to populations. So within Colm, which I, uh, the reason I'm focusing on that is one of the, the study results afterwards is about Colm, we had populations trapped between barriers. If you get them wiped out, that's it. There's no repopulation. So you've got enhanced risk to, to populations. Improved spawning condition. 108 hours it took fish to, uh, to ascend chipping one. I haven't got the number of attempts data, but we do have that. You can imagine how many times those fish were throwing themselves at that weir and the energy that's taken, the damage that that's caused to them. Their spawning ability uh, uh, will be vastly reduced. Reduced predation. On Swan side, we had wildlife cameras up to help with the security of our pit loops and, and do sort of mink uh, uh, surveys. And yes, we watched mink feeding on the trout that were bottlenecked below the weir. And that, the same happens if you think about chipping. Yes, they can get over it, but they're held up for five days where mink, otters, mergansers, poachers can come and easily net them out or, or eat them. Okay, barriers in the ribble. Not a great map. Um, this is a, a, a data set that's just being updated by Paul in the team um, because we've got a data set on barriers and the EA have a data set on barriers. Neither are complete, so actually there are more. But at present, we have about 400. And the purple lines are showing the disconnected habitat, completely disconnected. There is the, 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 these are the ones where fish can never get over. So you can see there is quite a lot of habitat that is completely inaccessible to fish. So we've got a lot of issues. Now, I'm going to skip past that one. That was a video, but um, I'm not taking that risk. So what have we done? Swanside, uh, this is actually some, uh, a fish passage solution that was developed by the Environment Agency for gauging stations. Uh, and so we decided that we, we would have a go at that on this weir. Uh, and essentially it's introducing heterogeneous flow, but something particular of note for me is, if you see at the bottom here this tow, we're creating a plunging flow effect. So one of the issues that we had on this weir, and Kyle and I, and Mark and I had on other weirs that had sloped faces like this, is the creation of a standing wave, which really introduces a difficulty for fish to ascend structures. So that's what we did. On chipping, it's not a great before and after photo, but what we did is we ripped out all of that concrete. However, we had to leave, you see, the crest of the weir across the top. We couldn't remove that because of erosion risk. We looked at that in 2009-10. But what we did is where this concrete was here, we created an embedded rock ramp. So we poured uh, some what they call grano mix, very hard concrete, and then we just embedded rocks into it to try and create a more natural sort of substrate, as it were. In Colne, we had a series of, well, there were seven barriers that we addressed, but I'm going to only talk about three. We had uh, this weir, yes, fish could get over it in certain flows and in certain conditions, but we wanted to improve that given the work that we were doing in the area. So we created what some within the Environment Agency will call a rock ramp, but really it's just a giant pool and traverse. It's two steps for, for fish to ascend. This was interesting in that we almost got an amazing EA win-win and a real one where there was a weir here and it used to have, you can just see where the vegetation is on the bank there and there's some bare bank just there. There used to be a weir crest across the top here that was vertical, which made that a complete obstruction to fish migration. And um, a certain phone call from someone in the agency uh, about something that was going on in the park uh, said that, um, oh, these guys are looking at spending about a hundred thousand pounds on a flood defense uh, scheme just downstream. If only someone could suggest that they removed part of the weir. And yes, I passed that on to someone else. And lo and behold, the Environment Agency saved themselves £100,000 or maybe £98,000 and took off the top of the weir. But we couldn't persuade them to tackle the rest. So we did create a, a proper true rock ramp. So that is a low gradient, about 10% natural substrate or natural-ish <coughs> substrate uh, riverbed. And this was the showstopper. This is what we call Ball Grove 3. So this is only half of the weir in this photo. It carries on with a slope down to a giant pool. 
And so you can see, yeah, okay, a fish could wriggle to here, and then in a really good <laughs> flow, it might wriggle to there, but then it's never gonna be able to make that final leap over the top. Um, my God, did we have some fun trying to figure out what to do here. But essentially what we did is we created, uh, inspired by Atkins, uh, they, they gave us the idea and then I took the design further, is that now the flow path of the river zigzags and there is a low gradient of about 10 or 15% where the fish move up and around and then through. That's a slightly better image taken by a local resident and what that was one of the th great things about this weir is at first there was a lot of unhappiness about the mess we were creating during construction but after we finished and reinstated people were really excited by this feature it started to look a bit more natural and we, we were getting people sending us amazing images like this one but what you can see is this is half of the s bend fish can negotiate their way through and around and then, then up and over and we worked really closely with the agency on this one because it, <coughs> it presented quite a flood risk issue we did want to remove it um, but upstream of here was a lodge which would have been uh, which is a national nature reserve and currently being designated as a triple SI which previously had been fed by a weir that had washed out and someone proposed rebuilding that I got this funny phone call from the environment agency again saying you know someone's trying to build a weir you might want to harness some angling power to um, address that so moving quickly on to has it worked well let's just define what is success is it complete passage is it partial passage? Is it faster passage? We really need to think about these things. So on Swanside Main Weir, this is what we started with, 21% efficiency, and we moved it up to 68%. So we feel that that was a success, and, and we were quite pleased. Not necessarily for this target audience, but for the first time on record, we've now have spawning salmon above that weir. So we were really pleased with that. Chipping number one, so a nice fish from chipping there. We had this success rate with a time to ascend of 108 hours moved to that success rate. So the success rate has hardly changed, but the time it took for the fish to ascend switched from 108 hours to 2.6, which I think is a success. So ball grove. Now, I was uh, a bit of a pain to, to Mike, who had set up this wonderful monitoring strategy, and then I went and built, or I, I got Adam and our team to go and build all these fish passage, uh, uh, fish passage solutions before Mike could do his before data. So we only have after data. But you can see there that our fish passage at each of those sites is between, well, 65% and 75%. So has, uh, is that successful? Yes, we, we would say it's been <coughs> successful. And we need to think about cumulative impacts here because what we have is if we in blue let's make some assumptions we don't have before data but we know that some fish could have got over the the first weir some fish could have got over the second weir but certainly no fish could have got over the top weir and if we apply a hundred uh, uh, if we do kind of a, a very basic model and say if there are 100 fish at the bottom trying to ascend how many get past the top obstruction before we did any work zero after we've done work, only 37. Because although we have improved fish passage, because it sounds high, the cumulative impacts, and I know this is something that Paul's really uh, tried to, to get the message out on before, and I couldn't find uh, that, that great theoretical graph you'd produce, Paul, but this is hard sort of data. Uh, it, it's showing that when we have cumulative barriers, we have to look for the highest fish passage solution possible because in this instance 75 percent sounds good but actually when you put three in a row you're only getting 37 percent of the fish over now what's quite interesting is you would say well are there better options are there better solutions and the honest answer is probably not never mind cost sometimes uh, and I, I love it with hydropower uh, is we'll build a Lorinier fish pass they're the best fish pass they're not hundred percent I think the best study I've seen is 95%. So, you know, Lorinier fish passes are not the best solution. So, David, you'll be quick. This is my last slide. You'll be really pleased. The takeaway messages from this really is that every structure in a river forms a barrier. It, it affects how the habitat is, how the fish can move, uh, and, and has various effects on their populations. Multiple barriers even if they're passable, 
or semi-passable can have major impacts on your fish populations. Improving fish passage is vital. It is. We know it's really important. <coughs> fish easements and fish passes are an improvement, but they are not a solution. They are mitigation. That is the, 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 the most important message. And we should always go for the best solution that you can afford. And that that's the horrible bit, that's the economics bit, is sometimes you can't afford the best, but you must go for the best you can afford. And I would go so far as to say, and I can't believe I'm saying this because it was something that was told to me by a certain person at the agency on the Fish Pass panel, is that if you can't put a good solution in, don't put a solution in. Because once you put that crap solution in place, that's it, you won't get an upgrade. So it's money down the drain, in effect. So always go for a good solution. But the best option is to remove weirs. It is by far the best uh, option. And this is an example. This is the first one we did with Kyle. What I should have done is put the picture of the field upstream. But what, what's phenomenal about this is actually the habitat response in that here, this was all pretty much scoured down to bedrock. This was the uh, almost immediately after removal. But two years on, we've got gravel bars forming we've got really nice river features occurring but do be careful don't go and just leave a weirs out so removing weirs needs a little bit of thought and, uh, and planning because although this weir removal cost us two thousand pounds mainly because the contractor got down to site started work and then this is in briarfield any of you who know the area will know that it's not the most um, safe place for your machinery and equipment and he gathered a crowd of rather interesting looking characters and he decided he was going to finish the job in a day even by <laughs> floodlights because he did not want to leave his machine on site overnight so it only cost us 2,000 the, the the upstream restoration works that we had to do cost us 20 so if we had done the work if we'd done the thinking and the planning a bit better then we probably wouldn't have had a problem uh, upstream and so I would say that with weir removals, you do spend more on the planning than you do on, on the removal. And it's one of the few instances I would say that's well justified. Thank you.